Hello, welcome to the program. First tonight, perhaps one of the most controversial and high-profile roles in our justice system is that of the Director of Public Prosecutions, a hot seat which has been filled by Paul Rove QC for the past 10 years with some distinction. But after one scrape with the law, you would imagine that Mr Rove would be very careful about the image of the position he holds. Well, it seems he may have dropped his guard again. Over a period of a week and a half, we observed our DPP visiting the local TAB and buying scratchy tickets up to 17 times in one working day. Now, while this is all perfectly legal, it does beg the question, is this the best use of Mr Rove's time? And is it setting the right standards for the office he holds? Graham Archer has this report. I think it's very much representing the public of South Australia. It's the Director of Public Prosecutions and that's the important part of the title, I think. What we would want with people who hold that sort of office um, are people who act in such a way um, that they are examples for others to follow, uh, not examples for others to avoid. Being the state's top lawman is no popularity contest. No, I don't think it can be described that way. And certainly South Australia's Director of Public Prosecutions, Paul Rofe QC, seems unfazed by the burdens of public office. But it must be a burden to be the man who has to put most of South Australia's criminals in jail. No, I enjoy the job. And little wonder. It's 11.15 on a normal Friday and the Perry Street TAB has just opened. And one of their first customers is our DPP. He's just made his way there after an hour of reading the paper in his favourite cafe. Again, both on One special... Perhaps the boss has simply drawn the short straw in the prosecutor's office punting syndicate. That must be it. Five minutes later, he's back to the office. But what's this? 25 minute pass and he's back again. This time to the news agency. Can't be the paper. It's the scratchies. And then back into the TAB. Probably forgot that tricky trifecta. It's like any job I guess. But now it's getting, well, more curious. 12.25 and he's back to the TAB. 1.40 and he's there again. Then into the news agency for more scratchies and back to the TAB at 2.05. 2.40, more scratchies. 2.42, the TAB again. Another coffee break and at 3.27, it's back to the TAB. 4.10, the TAB. 4.40, the TAB, and more scratchies. 5 o'clock, the TAB, and so on. In total, 12 TAB visits, five scratchy stops, and three coffee breaks. And another day of cornering crims is over. We do expect our judges, prosecutors, senior lawyers, um, to act in a way that's beyond reproach. Um, this would not be consistent with that. Bob Moles is a former associate professor of law at Adelaide Uni who has just completed a book on miscarriages of justice in this state. He's highly critical of the culture that has pervaded our criminal justice system over the past few decades. I've looked at quite a number of cases now over the last three to four years and I have to say that I find them to be quite baffling. I'm really quite puzzled as to how they've been handled. And questions have to be asked about what sort of work standards are being set. Over a week and a half, we watched the DPP make visit after visit to the TAB and the local news agency to buy scratchy tickets, as well as spend large amounts of time at the cafe. Every day this happened at an average of nine to ten gambling stops each day. All perfectly legal, of course. OK, what about the, um, the personal burden of the pressures of this job? What are they? Oh, I'm... They can be stressful. Your health has suffered at times? Yes. I know you're a heavy smoker and like a drink. Is that a product of the job? I think I was doing that before I started the job. What about the gambling? I don't regard it as a problem. There are also rumours that you had lost large sums at the casino. Yes, I've heard those rumours. They're not true? No. But you do like a flutter on the horses. I do. Mm. Then it's actually a bit more than a flutter. I wouldn't call it more than a flutter. We checked out the stories and one day recently you took 12 visits 
to the TAB in one day, in a working day, and five visits to the news agency to buy scratches. Must know someone's looking after me. It's 17 gambling stops in one working day is rather a lot, isn't it? I wouldn't say so, no. You don't think that that uh, reflects a bit on the amount of time and thought you're putting into the job? No, I don't think so. On a weekly average, you go about 10 times a day to either buy scratchies or go to the TAB. If you say so, I don't know. I don't keep count. It would be unfair to single out Paul Rofe as the only one accountable for the standards that those who sit in judgment on us seem to set for themselves. And is his apparent cavalier approach to his job symptomatic of a much deeper and more serious malaise in the administration of justice? We find that proper photographs aren't taken either at the scene or at autopsy. We find that clothing goes missing and the medical files go missing. Uh, and yet, when all of this comes before a, a judicial tribunal, such as the coroner's court or the magistrate's court or the trial court, um, instead of finding searching questions to say, well, why didn't this happen properly, it all just passes through as if that were normal and acceptable procedures. For example, Magistrate Peter Liddy was able to use his office to prey on children for almost 30 years. He even used public facilities, such as jails and courthouses, as venues for his abuse. To my understanding, there wasn't any knowledge of Mr Liddy's use of facilities. Well, I think there was. I mean, some of the kids were fingerprinted before they were taken into the cells. By Liddy? Yes, well, with the aid of attending police officers. Yes, I don't know those details. In fact, the judge, prosecutors, Liddy's defence lawyers and police all visited the locations during that trial. But this point doesn't appear to have been taken up by authorities. And it's the same system that tolerated a pathologist without proper qualifications as the head of our forensic science centre for almost 30 years. Despite a catalogue of incompetence, Professor Colin Manick was allowed to continue. One of the most troubling outcomes was the conviction of Henry Keogh. When we asked you about some of that evidence earlier, um, you weren't entirely upfront with us about some of it, were you? Yeah, I think I've been upfront about everything with Keogh. Well, I mean, take for instance the, um, that controversial <coughs> reenactment which challenged Professor Mannock's view of how Anna Jane Cheney might have been murdered. You said that no reenactment was contemplated by the prosecution. But there is documentation to say that there, there was that thought. I'm not sure what you mean. I'm... Well, there was documentation on the police running sheets that was partially blacked out after a, an FOI request that said that a reenactment was suggested by police and in consultation with you, uh, it was decided not to proceed. I am not aware of that material. Well, here it is, and you can make out the words intended to have been covered up. A later reenactment revealed it was almost impossible to murder someone in the manner suggested by Dr Manick. And there are many other questions hanging over the case. Let me put a proposal to you. Why don't you just open up all of the evidence to us with the appropriate experts, just make it all available, look at it, deal with it, clear the air, because it won't go away. As far as I'm concerned, it has, we've done, we've gone down that track. How would you sum up the handling of the Keogh case? I would have to say that uh, from beginning to end, it was the arch archetypal example of how not to conduct an investigation and how not to conduct a prosecution. Part of the problem with the culture of the system is that some of the people who work in it think it belongs to them. When some judges deny access to transcript and court documents when they have no lawful power to do so, then we have a problem. And is it any wonder that the justice system is open to criticism when someone like the DPP can't see his daily gambling is giving rise to all sorts of concerns? 
I just wondered whether that makes you <coughs> somewhat vulnerable in the position you're in. I think you've got to be careful of what you do, what you seem to be doing, yes. Because, you know, history tells us that uh, not many punters come out in front. No, that'd be so. How do you do? I wouldn't be in front, no. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that if, it's, uh, if it becomes a big issue, then don't you see that as being, I suppose, undesirable in the kind of job that you have? I haven't let it come to that point, but uh, yes, I'm, I don't deny the mm. premise. Do you think that um, this is appropriate behaviour for the Director of Public Prosecutions? I don't see what's inappropriate about it. No one is suggesting Paul Rofe has been compromised, but who is actually looking out for the reputation of the office of the DPP or the man himself? We have known of this behaviour for some time via police, lawyers and politicians, none of whom approve, but nor do they appear to have taken any action, not even a cautionary word. It strikes me that um, uh, if you are going to visit a gambling establishment or buy some form of uh, gambling commodity ten times a day during your work, then it's become something of an obsession. That's your opinion, I... No. You, you don't think it's an obsession? No. Have you... Have you ever thought of getting some help on it? No. Do you think that would be a good idea? No, not at the moment. None of your friends have said, listen, Paul, maybe you ought to lay off the gambling a bit? No. I suppose the other question is, if you do that so regularly, when do you get your work done? I get the work done quite easily. You don't sense that there's a feeling around the office that you are absent more than you're present? No. You've had not, not that raised with the staff? <coughs> Certainly no one's brought it to my attention. I'm not sure that this is good for your image. No, I'd take your comments. I mean, I can do no more than that. And if you need any more evidence of the different standards that seem to apply... Without nitpicking, even things like littering and tossing butts down and throwing away bits of paper, probably not a good idea for the Director of Public Prosecutions. No, I'd agree with that. One would think that the um, head of the prosecution system would, in their public behaviour, act in a way um, that doesn't show that they have a disregard for the laws or rules of a system. Sometimes people don't actually realise what it is that the public expect of them, that they become comfortable. Well, that's the last thing I'd describe about this job, being comfortable, isn't it? Mm. OK, well, I don't suppose I had it to the comfort. <laughs> no, it's, again, goes with the job. And today we received numerous faxes from members of the legal profession expressing their support for Mr Rove and emphasising that he has fulfilled his duties with distinction. We also received a press release from the Attorney-General saying that Mr Rove has given an undertaking not to gamble at work.